Good afternoon from Miami, Florida. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting for Larkin Medical TV, the innovators in medical education, and the neurosurgery channel. Today we have the pleasure of having Richard Mandel, MD, a spinal surgeon from Tampa, Florida, who's going to do a presentation on cranio-vertebral junction. And we're also joined uh, by a fine cast. Uh, we'll start, uh, fine panelists, we'll start by introducing them. And we can start with Eleonora. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eleonora, and I'm a final year medical student from Rome, Italy, and I'm almost done with my study. So, and I'm really interested Yay. in neurology. Great to, have you. Great to have you, Eleonora. And Frederick. Hi, my name is Frederick. Um, I'm from Belgium, fourth year out of seven. I'm super interested in a neurosurgical field um, and really excited uh, about today's hangout. Okay, w welcome, Frederick. Mm. And the sharp dog, Simon. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Simon Nouns. I'm in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, and uh, I'm a developmental child psychologist and a second year medical student. I'm looking forward to this uh, hangout as usual. Thank you very much. Well, I welcome Simon. And okay, Richard, it's all yours. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> how does it? It looks good. It looks good. Does it? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so <clears throat> recently, I, I think it was in April of this year, the um, Journal of Neurosurgery has a has a um, pro uh, has a uh, educational program called uh, Neurosurgical Focus, and they did an update on craniovertebral junction diseases that I I went through, and um, um, I also had read. Uh, a very good book on the craniovertebral junction recently. So I'll just give you some highlights of that. And, you know, the craniovertebral junction is really very uh, complicated anatomy. And the surgical approaches and the instrumentation for you guys isn't as important as knowing, learning something about the anatomy there and also the relevant disease processes. The actual surgical approaches and instrumentation are, are very technically oriented and I think are would be a, not a, not quite as interesting for you, but we'll go through that but not, not spend quite as much time on it. Um, here's, um, <clears throat> here are the sources. The Surgery of the Craniovertebral Junction, this is the um, second edition by Tima, uh, it was published in two thir two th 2013 by Bam Bakitis, Dickman, Spetzer, and Sontag, and then as I mentioned, the Neurosurgical Focus on the Craniovertebral Junction in April of, of this year, 2015. Um, so, just just some um, bibliographic mentions now. Okay, Dr. Sontag, Volker Sontag and his partner, Dr. Spetzler, they, they um, designed quite a few uh, instruments to bring attention to the craniovertebral junction, such as transoral uh, surgical access kits to get through the back of the mouth and to the top of the craniovertebral junction. Alan Crocker was a, is a neurosurgeon who's in London at Queen's Square and I went to see him operate quite a bit when um, when I was over there. And he really got people from all over the all over Europe really to come see him and to do craniovertebral junction surgery. Another really big pioneer in the craniovertebral junction is uh, Arnold Menezes. He's been at the University of Iowa for many years and he did a lot, really a tremendous amount of work in pediatric craniovertebral junction so that people like Dr. Brockmeyer at the University of Utah, a lot of, a, a lot of people have uh, benefited from these three, three people's experiences. Now, Dr. Sontag's partner, Dr. Spetzer, is very famous. I didn't really put him on the list because 
everybody knows him. Dr. Uh, Crocker, you may not know as well just because uh, you're getting this from an American rather than a European, but Alan Crocker is quite a big deal in, uh, in London and, you know, he gets nationals from all over Europe, like I said. Dr. Menezes is from Peru. He's at the University of Iowa, but I think he still, you know, lectures and travels around the world. There's also a, quite a few very well-known orthopedic surgeons who have done a lot in terms of the craniovertebral junction um, <clears throat> as well. And, you know, they they um, uh, include people like Dr. Uh, uh, White Cloud and um, uh, you know several other people. Rick Sasso is another person who's done a lot with craniovertebral junction literature. Now the other two people here are Titan, the mythologic uh, character Titan, and Atlas, who in Odys in the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, he was the person that s held the pillars up so that the sky didn't touch the earth. So the atlas is likened, you know, the atlas of the, the neck is likened to atlas in the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, all right, so, <clears throat> you know, I talked about the complicated anatomy and the biomechanics, okay? So give some thought to this now. You know, it, you all know that in the in the body, as you leave the heart, arteries arteries uh, diverge all over the body. But I'm not <clears throat> I'm not sure about this. But to me, I think the the vertebral arteries are the only arteries I know of that that converge into the vertebral. Um, I don't know of any other other arteries, maybe in a portal system, but does anybody else know of any arteries that converge as you go further distally? Um, yeah, I've tried to look that up, mm -hmm. but I, I, I it, it well, seems. I, I guess the, the circle of Willis wouldn't be one, would it? Would well, be. that is, you know, that's what that's what is the circle of Willis is, you know, the oh. basilar artery. Okay. Uh, going into that anastomotic circle, but okay, okay. I don't know of any arteries anywhere else in the body that converge as they go distally. They usually diverge, I think. Right. There must be an exception besides that, but I, I don't know of one. Anyway, okay. with the craniovertebral junction, there's a lot of disease entities that cause uh, craniovertebral abnormalities and of course the malformations are going to occur early in life the congenital malformations and the the fact is that higher cervical trauma above the uh, atlas and access um, is not all that uncommon so that you see craniovertebral junction disease in the extremes of age in the in the children in the babies and in the elderly but because of trauma and tumors, you also see it dispersed in, um, uh, you know, throughout life, not just at the extremes. But, for instance, the C2 fractures that occur, they're usually a bimodal distribution. And so you tend to see that with a peak in both the third and the uh, seventh decades. Um, Dr. Nanda, Neil Nanda, at University of uh, Louisiana Shreveport. He's the chairman, but he, uh, he had a lot of his um, residents and, and colleagues work on a recent study that's included in the craniovertebral junction focus from April. And they, they really looked at um, the cost, the economic costs of fractures in the elderly and, and injuries to C2 and um, um, looked at the impact that that has on on healthcare outcomes and costs because it's very common to see elderly people with a 
odontoid fracture after a hyperextension injury. And, you know, these are not, not patients who were in that great a condition to undergo uh, a, a larger procedure. And so it's become a lot more common now to treat these patients with, um, with bracing or wearing a co hard collar for an indefinite period of time in the hopes that they achieve a kind of fibrous union so that they don't have to undergo surgery. This is, a, this is a good diagram. I think the people at the Barrow had a little bit more, a little bit better one, but this shows you your sclerotomes or your somites and how the bones go in to form the craniovertebral junction. So you, you see there's a lot of mixing of what in, in uh, embryonic development we call the proatlas or what you know, precedes the atlas how the atlas gets formed and um, uh, you know there's anterior and posterior aspects of the atlas and the ring uh, that, it, that it forms and you know each of these different sclerotomes or, 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 or areas of osseous development different diseases can result in different deformities at the craniovertebral junction. Mm -hmm. All right, so with, with regard to neurologic findings in a craniovertebral junction, what you're talking about is the, you know, the clivus, the foramen magnum, the, the med medullary area around, you know, in the brainstem, which exits through the foramen magnum. So you can see a, a tremendous amount of variation in neurologic findings. So clivus fractures or, or um, atlanto-occipital fractures and dislocations or condyle fractures, atlas fractures, odontoid fractures, hangman's fractures, and C2 vertebral body fractures, those are all craniovertebral junction area traumas. And so you can see what's called a Bell's cruciate paralysis, or some people call it it's also been referred to as a hemicruciate paralysis, where you may have paralyzation, pa uh, paralysis of the upper but not the lower limbs, um, or you can see central cord syndromes. You can see cranial nerve um, lesions at the um, at the medullary area. So you're talking about the ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth nerves. Now there are also several tumors that occur in the craniovertebral junction area, places like the clivus and also the sacrum is a particularly uh, concerning area for the development of chondrosarcomas which tend to develop in the clivus or in the sacrum. Now as far as vascular lesions, you can get brainstem compression in the medullary area and that can form a lateral medullary plate syndrome, which is what's also called by neurologists a Wallenberg syndrome or a medial medullary plate syndrome as well. And the other common thing to keep in mind is Chiari malformations in children. And then you also want to worry about syringomyelia if there's a sensory uh, um, dissociation between la um, la lateral columns and posterior column sensation. Um, all right, so here here's a um, uh, anatomic cut, a microtome cut through the um, um, C2 body, and so you're really looking now at the at the craniovertebral junction. Here's the tip of the dens, and this is the anterior arch of C1 going around the dens, which of course is C2. Now, there are a lot of ligaments here, and to try to learn the um, radiology, uh, radiologic appearance of those ligaments, it may be good to speak with a good um, 
um, neuroradiologist who could maybe show, go through some MRI slides with you, or uh, look at some of the uh, articles. You can get them on Google as well. That'll show you the relationship of things like this: the apical ligament, the alar ligament, the atlantoaxial joint, transverse ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament. There's a lot of ligaments here, but you want to pay particular attention to the transverse ligament. I think you know that that's really seems to be uh, the most important ligament to really have intact at this at this area but you know the injury to the apical synovial cruciforms can all lead to a, an unstable transverse ligament but your transverse ligament is what goes from C, one side of C2 to the other and keeps um, um, uh, I'm sorry one side of C1 to the other so that C2 and C1 are, are well opposed at the atlantoaxial junction. So this would be, you know, the pre-dental space here. This is A1, the front of uh, the, uh, the the one of the front of C1 here. This is the C2, the dens. This is the pre-dental space, which, you know, in, in Earlier days, when people used to read X-ray radiologists read X-ray studies, they'd really carefully look at that pre-dental space to see if there was widening. This is the post-dental space, or you know, uh, retro-dental space. This is an area you really want to pay very close attention to because here is where you'll see big panis formations in people with diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. And as you know, rheumatoid arthritis is not all that uncommon. And so you want to check for the competency of ligaments in people with Down syndrome, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, there's often a, a pseudosubluxation at 2-3 or 3-4 in some of these patients. Um, so th these are just things to keep in mind when you s start evaluating the craniovertebral junction. There's a lot to keep in mind uh, in that area. All right, so if you look at older literature where radiologists are being taught how to read the different lines between the clivus and the odontoid process, there are so many with we call craniometric lines like the Wackenheim's line and all these different named lines like the Ranawat line and all that which I, I, honestly I don't remember any of them all that well I just you know look and buy it and try to discern whether everything looks appropriately um, but and that that becomes somewhat important especially when you're checking for what are relatively you know, common problems like a Chiari malformation. I'll have some slides in here for you uh, to look at in just a minute. Um, this is a demonstration where I don't I don't like this drawing all that much, but it, here's the the MRI and here's the clivus, right, right here, and so the clivus is coming down here. Here's what's called the epistheton or the back wall of the frame and magnum. And what you want to look for here is this is the anterior ring of C1 right, right here as it wraps around C2, and here's the posterior arch of C1, okay? So you want to look at all those relationships and you want to discern whether or not there, there's a problem there. Um, and that it's got normal alignment. Now, in the um, next few slides, they're coming up. I'll show you some some of the differing uh, disease entities. There's occipital anomaly, anomalies like what's called basilar invagination, and basilar invagination means that the cervical spine is actually telescoping up. Into the into the head, or platybasia, where 
we, the, it means a flattening of the, the posterior aspect of the occiput. Now, aplasias or hypoplasias of the arch, that means anterior or posterior parts of C1 are, are very asymmetric. So, so that can cause a big asymmetry. And the same goes for fusions and what we call segmental anomalies. Anomalies of the dens are another uh, issue. Now, an, a typical anomaly of the dens could be something like an osodontoidium where you don't have a solid dens. You know, part of it may be uh, some car cartilaginous um, remnants or uh, maybe just an incompetent dens. You've heard of clipophile syndrome. Those are people that will typically have um, fused cervical spine segments or incomplete uh, uh, um, differentiation and development. So they may have like block vertebra. Oftentimes they'll have a very low, low hairline um, down syndrome. You frequently face with um, instability of the upper cervical spine. And then Chiari malformations, which I, I hope to show you in a few minutes. All right, so <clears throat> the congenital malformations, obviously, are things that are going to give you trouble early in life. And, um, but you still want to keep an eye on other things because there are progressive disease processes like in, in Down syndrome children that are growing up, getting into teenage years or adult years, that have ongoing opportunities for instability. And of course, things like rheumatoid arthritis or any uh, autoimmune diseases where a panis can develop behind the dens. And when that, that, when that panis gets big enough, it creates compression on the cord, um, which it sits in front of. But rheumatoid arthritis is one of your most common chronic ongoing diseases that, you know, require you to come up with a strategy that you may have to adjust during the patient's lifetime. And the Ranawat classification is one of the systems that's used for judging the severity of rheumatoid arthritis in the craniovertebral junction. All right, now with the advent of MRI, we really got um, a lot more information about the occipital cervical junction and trauma that is related to it. Atlantoaxial rotatory dislocations are very well known and have been described for like a hundred years. You know, children, children would often have a retropharyngeal process like an upper respiratory tract infection or a dental infection and get a retropharyngeal abscess and these kids would end up with a um, Rye neck, or what's called a, a cock robin appearance of the head, where the head's cocked off to one side, and they can be hard to um, um, uh, get back into alignment. Uh, but with MRI imaging, we're better, much better at characterizing these rotatory dislocations. We can see odontoid fractures and hangman's fractures that are part of. Uh, the OC junction problems, but the really significant problem that you see is the dislocation of the occipital cervical junction. These are people who have tremendously destabilizing injuries, and it used, uh, I think in the past, most people died before really come, coming to medical attention. These would be like on the scene accident where the head is actually disconnected from the spine or the vertebral arteries uh, are uh, of evulsed or, or uh, stretched to so, such a degree that people have profound strokes. But there have been, since the 90s, literature about 
tremendously in unstable fractures and, and uh, children su surviving the trauma and, and end up doing well, but they of course needed occipital cervical fusion uh, to regain their stability. Um, all right, so with with the craniovertebral junction, there are a lot of things that you routinely worry about, like you do in any other part of the body. Blood supply, you know, the neurovascular supply, um, and uh, stability, um, tumor types. But the other thing you have to remember is things like metabolic bone disease. Because when there's in, um, inadequate bone remodeling or diseases like osteogenesis imperfecta or Paget's disease, this is where you know you can develop a pre in a previously normal cranial vertebral junction or pre-diseased state that gets worse. In addition to just metabolic bone diseases, there's other inherited diseases that get worse. Like I don't know if you guys remember those mucopolysaccharidosis diseases you learn in biochemistry, like Morquier syndrome, San Filippo's, Hurlers. Those are all uh, diseases that can cause problems with the craniovertebral junction. This is a, a CT reconstruction of uh, bone uh, at the craniovertebral junction. And the imaging is excellent here where you can really get a good feel for the bony anatomy. And in preoperative planning, you need to know that if you're going to put a screw into C1, into the lateral mass of uh, C1 or the pars of C2, you need to know that there's not some aberrant course of that vertebral where you could potentially occlude a vertebral artery. Um, um, and you know you want to know ahead of time if if there is a uh, problem, you want to know which side to go on, which side you really have the best chance of getting a screw in, and maybe on the other side you don't place a screw, but instead you choose to um, um, uh, attach another type of uh, device or a clamp rather than a, a screw going from uh, C going from a transarticular or going into C2 and into C1. Um, so the imaging is really very important. You have to look through the cuts. These are some of the other diseases that I mentioned. Down syndrome, achondroplasia, Morquier's disease, Marfan syndrome, and, and the mucopolysaccharidosis we talked about, which more ways is one of them. All right, so here are some films to take a look at now. I hope this projects well for you. Um, what you see here is the dens is tipping back, bending backwards. It appears that there may be a fracture right here across the dens. And this dens is really projecting backwards, and you're getting, you've got a panis formation here behind uh, C, um, behind C2, and you're really deforming the area around the brain stem. Um, and this is really more like a ponto medullary beaking or medullary beaking, where there's kind of a indentation of the canal. You see a poorly formed segmentation here uh, above C23. Um, That's a lateral MRI, right? Yeah, this is an MRI with the patient. You're getting a, a sagittal cut with the patient's nose facing to the left. Okay. Right? So you see, like, the rest of the brain looks fine, right? You have your ventricular system, your your thalamus, your pons and 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 
midbrain and pons and medulla, but you see this large indentation here above the clivus. Right. And you see that there's a, a, a big loss of signal here uh, behind where this panis formation is. All right, now here's an example of a um, C1, C2 fusion. And this was popularized by two different people, Dr. Goyal, um, and I believe he was from India, and Dr. Harms also did this. Uh, and Dr. Harms is from Germany, but this is a, a lateral mass of C1 and a PAR screw at C2 in a sagittal plane. Okay, and so you're seeing the screws here and here without disturbing the the uh, vertebral artery, which, as you go out laterally on C1, uh, you know, for, forms somewhat laterally in a flat portion of the bone of C1. All right, so here's another another MRI. Okay, so. This again is a sagittal with the mouth here, the patient's nose here, looking laterally. Okay, now look closely, and you're going to see here's the clivus, you know, the tip of the clivus. Here's the odontoid, and you do see that there's bending or beaking of the medulla, right? The pons right. and medulla are cramped there. Right. Now you look here, and you know, I I don't know that this is. Um, I don't know that this is um, a um, panis forming or whether this is um, uh, just a cut a little off off uh, center where the um, ligaments look large. But pay attention back here to the occipital bone. Here's the posterior fossa, right? So here's the tentorium, and what you see is the the um, uh, back of the frame and magnum, but what you see here is all this tonsil of the cerebellum hanging way down below the frame and magnum, right? right. So your tonsils really should end about the level of the frame and magnum. Right. But what you have here is a Chiari malformation where you have so much of the, the cerebellar tonsils hanging down and so what that does is it crowds the frame and magnum. So when the frame and magnum gets crowded, it's like putting a cork in it. You're no longer getting good flow of the CSF around the brain stem and, and uh, spinal cord. So what happens is it's like a, a water hammer effect. And so what do you see here? You see this large thing here? Seeing over here. Yeah. That's yeah. That's syringomyelia. That's a cyst that's formed mm -hmm. as a result of the Chiari malformation. And you know, a long time ago, there were debates about how to fix these and what needed to be done, and whether you needed to fix the Chiari and drain the syrinx and etc. I think most people now would just go in and do what's a mostly a bony operation. Posteriorly, you know, give a lot more room into into the frame and magnum, and uh, you know, sewing like a dural patch graft in there. And oftentimes, you'll see these syrinxes resolve on their own. And you know, remember the syrinx. While this one forms here, and oftentimes they do form high up. They can form lower down too, as well. So you kind of need to do do a survey to make sure that the it's only one syrinx. So that's a Chiari malformation, and if you spend any time in a children's hospital, a busy enough children's hospital, you're gonna um, you're gonna see a syringomyelia. Um, so I think that's a pretty much an overview of the craniovertebral junction. The um, slides, the surgical approach slides um, are more, um, um, the positioning and surgical approach really 
is more of what we call like a far lateral approach and, and the surgery is really geared towards the frame and magnum or Dr. Um, Dr. Gokostelin at Johns Hopkins, Zia Gokostelin, he does a very uh, elegant mandible splitting and goes in a transoral approach to the you know the front of the uh, the um, craniovertebral junction. Um, that that's not something I, I I've done it on cadavers. I, I, it's not for me to do. I haven't done one of them. <laughs> um, and uh, if I had that kind of case, that's something I would send to Dr. Gukasalan. Um But you know, you get an idea of the anatomy here, and then the approaches to the anatomy. What does work? What doesn't work? How far up or down you can go? Um, Dr. Uh, Denny McDonald is a terrific neurosurgeon. Um, he used to be the chairman at the University of uh, uh, um, Georgia in Augusta. Um, he, he was really he he did a great retropharyngeal approach, and that got you up about as high in the pharynx as you could go without going through the mouth or coming in from posteriorly. But um, you know, he he really felt that all those patients needed to be traked postoperatively at least for some period of time. Um, all right, I think that's it in terms of the slides. I think that was eighteen. So slide eighteen. Yeah, that that's it. Okay. Okay, Richard, that was great. Uh, and you know, one thing I can say, because uh, I'm a student too of, of this, it's not really a part of the uh, body I know well, but I, I can tell to the students that it's a very important part uh, to know well, the radiographs especially. I know that in the ER, uh, you have C lateral C spines, X-rays that you're going to have to read on an emergency basis, and Richard, I'm sure you went through the same thing. You've got to learn it well. Uh, and uh, okay, okay, uh, students. Uh, any questions, of Richard? Uh, may I ask a question? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, regarding the the penis formation behind the C1 or C2, regarding, in, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis, why is it that a penis does not form in the thoracic or lumbar sacral region? Well, the penis forms. Um, at the interface between C1 and C2 um, and you know those it's motion dependent there there's instability there and that's why that panis forms and you know a lot of people used to go in and resect try to resect the panis or resect the dens why they did a fusion there but it's I think it's generally acknowledged now that most a lot of those panaces just resorb on their own once the motion stops across them. So you know I think it's a it's a um, it's a mechanical issue as to why why the um, panis forms, and I'm not sure what it is about the um, rheumatoid arthritis that is so uh, so accommodating for panis formation, but I just have to assume it's part the uh, inflammatory, inflammatory process and part mm -hmm. the motion, the instability between C1 and C2. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I see. That, that makes that, sense. But, you know, 20 years ago, guys were arguing, oh, you got to resect the panis, you don't have to resect the panis, you know, but uh, you're... I think a lot of people have shown that those panaces do tend to resorb once motion stopped. But um, uh, the, it's a good question. And from what John said, you know, you don't need, it, it's like anything in medicine, you know, it sounds like, you know, all right, I know a lot about n neurosurgery, but 
when, when, when you look at a medical case, you, you got to have a gestalt for what's right and what's not right. You may not know every term, but if something looks funny to you, you have to figure out why. You just get used to looking at normals, and I, I think you'll occasionally you'll see some abnormalities that are kind of normal variants, but you want to have a, a gut feeling for what's stable and what's not stable. Uh, you know, you know, Richard. One thing you talked a lot about soft tissue shadows of the ligaments. And that's something I probably should have learned better as an emergency physician. Do you spend a lot of time when you're called to the ER and you're looking at a lateral C spine? Do you spend a lot of time looking at soft well, tissue shadows? You know, um, I, 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 I try to, but the thing is that there, there is um, a whole movement of foot right now that um, a man named Demadian, uh, Demadian was one of the early, early people to invent or at least maybe developed at the same time the idea of magnetic resonance imaging. He used to work with Hitachi in what was called their Phonar division. Dr. Demadian now has a, um, an MRI uh, scanner where you stand upright and they flex, you flex and extend your neck during this MRI while you're standing up. Right. And um, that is a scan that's really sensitive to the ligaments in and around C1, C2, or o occipital to cervical. So, you know, the technology is getting better. Now, I'm not endorsing the product. I'm just saying that a lot of people are interested in it. And I don't want to leave you with the impression you were just flex and extend somebody who was grossly unstable. This right. isn't to ch check for gross instability. That, that you're going to recognize on an MRI. But for subtle instability where people are complaining of chronic problems, people are looking a lot more at these ligaments. And there, you know, there's some ideas that laxity there could result in all kinds of different things. Nothing is scientifically proven yet. But... A lot of people are looking at these special studies for evaluation of ligaments. So those ligaments are tough. I mean, they're very small ligaments, and it, you know, if you're not used to looking at them all the time, I wouldn't. It wouldn't surprise me that you could miss something small like that. You, you'd have to have a pretty good neuroradiologist go through that with you. But you know, it's being. It's being done now. It's something that's in development. It's just probably something you can watch a webinar on. I'm sure you could find it on NAS or on the American Orthopedic Association or the um, ANS or CNS a webinar on you know cervical spine MRI anatomy. Okay, Richard. Before I ask this question, you can you can get off the screen share and just click on the arrow and you'll get arrow. off. It. Okay. So, so we can see you. Uh, you know, I, 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 a quick story uh, to the students, uh, an interesting story. Uh, we had a patient, a car accident victim, come in, a, a Japanese fellow in Atlanta. And the only he had, he was in the sea collar because, as you know, you always put a sea collar on a car accident that comes in the ER. The only sign he had, he could not lift his head. And luckily, I kept the sea collar on. It was neurologically intact. The, and we get tomograms, and he had a transverse odontoid fracture. He had absolutely no pain at all. And that can show you how subtle things are with the C-spine and how tricky they are. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the issues, you know. That's, Dr. Nanda's group in, out of LSU at Shreveport did, looked at that because you guys are going to be, I think, amazed at how many, how many elderly people who have a little myelopathy, uh, they fall and they hyperextend their necks. It, it's incredible how, how many odontoid fractures you see in elderly people. And, um, you know, a, a lot of times there's very little in the way of pain. And, and sometimes you find these fractures months and months later. And, you know, luckily with uh, uh, odontoid fractures, uh, um, 
it's th there's a lot of room around the cord at that level. There's you know quite a bit, mm -hmm. and um, so you may not find any neurologic deficits from a dense from a fracture of the odontoid, and also you know people are always scared of hangman's fractures, but the truth of the matter is a hangman's fracture, which is basically a cleavage right through the pedicles of C2, okay, mm -hmm. that usually expands the canal. It's very rare to see neurologic deficits in somebody with a hangman's fracture. I mean, you know, that, that isn't hung and dead. I mean, <laughs> neurologic deficits one, yeah. from uh, the one sign, dead. injury to the canal. So, okay, uh, Frederick and uh, Eleonora, do you have some questions? Yeah, um, I had one. Um, Regarding the, stati the statistics of um, Chiari malformation, um, it says it's more um, often in women. Um, and I was wondering, um, maybe you, you have some kind of explanation why that is, maybe hormones or something, I was wondering. Um, I, I'm not sure, are you, are you make, uh, I'm not sure where, you, what you're referring to, but you know, with Chiari, Chiari's names on a lot of different things, you know, there's a Bud Chiari syndrome, there's a couple of different ones. I thought with Chiari's, Chiari type 2, um, I didn't think you had um, a sexual preference for that. I didn't think that, but may, I, I can't imagine why that would be, because, you know, it's, it's just a... Um, um, what you have is just crowded, a very crowded, compact frame and magnum. You know, if you look at enough CAT scans, you'll be able to kind of tell just by looking at the posterior fossa near the frame and magnum about how crowded it is back there because this is a judgment call you have to make a lot. You'll see people, and oftentimes radiologists will say, a, uh, a, um, Chiari variant, there's, it's not really a variant. Uh, there's different de measurements about how far the tonsils can be down uh, below the frame and magnum. And if, if the area is crowded and the patient's having neurologic problems, the ability to fix the Chiari malformation is, it has very good outcomes. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not sure about why there would be a um, gender disparity for Chiari's. Matter. Yeah, um, I I read it, it was about um, Chiari malformation type one. Um, oh, oh, a type one. Okay, type one and type two. Well, yeah, female. I, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I I'm, I just don't recall right now. But okay. I'll try to find out for you. Okay, okay uh, Ele Eleonora, do you have a question? Yeah, Richard, we talk about the um, rheumatoid arthritis as a cause of the fractures. So, do we have any treatments to for these patients? And this treatment may be different from the treatment we use in other patients. So, yeah, yeah. Well, with rheumatoid arthritis, you know, you're going to be making a lot of decisions in conjunction with the rheumatologist that's involved and it's kind of like um, it's kind of like um, all the other patients that may have like Morquier's disease or all those um, bone physiology problems or bone metabolism problems you're going to get some input about you know what the best thing to do in terms of getting a uh, improving the bone quality is and the rheumatoid people are, are, are people that you tend to follow for, for a long time same with the Down syndrome patients you follow them you may have an initial cervical spine series from 10 or 15 years ago that's gotten a little worse and now you're transitioning over to MRI rather than the plain cervical spine films yeah, you watch these patients, and there is an algorithm for what what you're going to do um, for the patients over time. You, you're not; these aren't patients you're going to 
fix the first time out and never see them again. These are people you're going to fix, and they're going to have further problems down the line, so you're going to do an operation that allows you to build upon that and add 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 as you go along as you need to, you know, mm -hmm. if that occurs. There, there are, if you look up craniovertebral junction, I guess I should have gotten you one of the slides. You know what, I might be able to grab it. W one second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me see if I can grab one sure. of them. Okay. In the it's, meanwhile, it's an algorithm. Okay. In the meanwhile, we'll say hi to Ven and Wendy. Hi. Hey, hi. Hi, Wendy. Ven, uh, say where you're from. Can you introduce yourself, please, real quick? Yep. I'm Ven from Michigan. I'm an insulin medicine physician. I'm glad to be here. Okay. Thank Sorry welcome, for the late. Welcome, Ben. And Wendy, yeah, can, you you. Say, can you say hi, Wendy, please? Hi. How are you guys doing? I'm a medical student. Um, doing rotations in internal medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, welcome Wendy. Oh, you'll, Wendy. Be able, you'll be able welcome to see... internal medicine, Wendy. Thanks. You'll be able to see the <laughs> present, presentation of Richard. and uh, uh, it, it's, it's taped, so we'll send you the link. Sounds good. Let okay. me see if I can project this for you. Hold on a second. In the meantime, uh, Simon, you were asking about the panels, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Then it's not necessarily, uh, you know, it depends on the severe. It depends on the severity of the inflammation. Like, usually the severity is, I mean, it's severe in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So that's why you you see more commonly in rheumatoid arthritis. But panis could be in the eyes also. I, oh, I, I see. mean, kerat keratitis and those kind of things. Some fibrotic yeah. formation can come up. That that's an in inflammatory fluid that destructs. That destroys the you know, but if, if it's in the joints, it, it it destroys the cartilage. I see. Wherever, you know, wherever it is, it destroys. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ben. Yep. Eleanor, oh. can you see this algorithm? Yeah. Okay. So like, he, here's one of the um, um, one of the algorithms, and this is where you're trying to define uh, instability. Now, instability is very difficult to define. Orthopods, neurosurgeons, radiologists, they all disagree. You know, there are different groups about different thoughts about what constitutes stability. But the general idea of stability of the spine is that it's, it's a platform on which to safely hold the limbs and the head so you can see out on the horizon and that there is no deformity that causes uh, that could cause physiologic damage to the spine by not being able to withstand a load, you know, normal load. But here, here you have they're trying to define clinical versus radiologic instability. So they talk about C1, C2 instability and what you need, and C2 and then clivus instability or hypoplasia and what you might need to do and if you have uh, some element of stability you may want to do a less a, a more uh, conservative operation to begin with and then extend the fusion up to include the occiput later on or you know if you feel that the occiput is stable and that the instability is at C1 and 2 because it's, let's say it's an odontoid fracture, then you know you could just put screws into C1 and C2 and leave the occiput alone. You don't want to, you don't want to fuse somebody, especially at the occiput, if they don't need it. Uh, but if they have an ongoing disease where uh, the occiput may get involved later on, it may be something you choose to do a definitive operation at C1, C2 with plans to extend the operation up later to include a loop or something that will connect to the the uh, occiput. And um, you know, we used to we used to be very uh, people used to talk about placing screws in the occiput and where to place the screws and there was a lot of debate and we wouldn't go in the midline and um, now we scan, we do a CT scan of the occiput and we look for the big bony midline keel 
and that's where we put all the screws now. Um, you know, it's just a, a change in technique, and that seems to have much better pullout strength. So, you know, the algorithms change as, as we figure out what we were wrong about, what we were right about, you know. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, very good. Well, Wendy or Ben, any questions of Richard? Uh, any comments? Dr. Mendel, how exactly did the settings form? I mean, you know, what is exactly the pathology? You know, we have different causes for With syringomyelia. Syringomyelia? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, th there's been a lot of people that have been interested in that over the years. Um, Dr. Uh, now there's a guy at UCLA, Dr. B starts with a B. Uh, he's been writing about it for years, and the guys at downstate New York were really interested in it. Yes, yeah, syringomyelia. Some people claim it's a like a water hammer effect of you have um, um, blockage and poor flow, and you get mm -hmm. um, Increased pressures and the syrinx gets you know forms and gets larger. But um, I don't know the answer to it. There's been a mm -hmm. few different proposed mechanisms, but I can tell you one thing, and that is when I was a, a medical student, a lot of people still believed in operating on syrinxes, and uh, mm -hmm. I put many a syrinx shunt in. I don't ever remember one of them working well. So <laughs> I kind of steered away from syringomyelia. And, uh, you know, if I do a Chiari uh, operation, I really do just decompress the Chiari and uh, mm -hmm. sew in a graft. And uh, I try not, I, I, I really don't go near the, the uh, syrinx. I hope that it, abs mm -hmm. it resorbs over time. Mm -hmm. But there have been many people that have tried shunts and all kinds of things for syrinxes, but it, it's pretty difficult. Um, you have to have a very high, uh, you have to have thick skin for that because the, I don't see very many promising improvements with syringomyelia. Okay. I, I, I know, but I'm just wondering you know, if we know the process so that you know we could prevent this, you know, forming yeah. instead of going for shunts and all that once, once it is well, formed? Once, um, you know, first of all, on MRI now, you can see the central canal in the spinal cord, and a lot of times you'll hear the radiologist say large central canal versus syrinx, and you know, those very, the very small ones are something I just watch. But when you see, a, you know, a large syrinx, uh, you have to think about other things, one being von Hippel-Landau disease and the possibility of a hemangioblastoma being in the middle of that syrinx. So those are people that you give uh, contrast to to rule out that there's a tumor in that uh, syrinx, but um, you know there are several several decent mechanisms that explain why cysts form there. But you know I've seen I've seen people with very big syrinxes that aren't all that um, disabled, and I've seen other people with syrinxes that I wouldn't think would be that all that much of a problem that they do seem to be disabled from but you know a lot of a lot of what you find with syringomyelia is the physical exam and if they have a lot of what we call sensory dissociation if they don't have a lot of sensory disturbance or they have tremendous sensory disturbance i i'm not at all confident you're doing them a favor okay any more questions okay. from the students from thank you doctor Eleonora or Frederick, any or Wendy, any any more questions? Well, I have one, Richard. Uh, yeah. ha, ha, has the art of imagery of the that area of the body improved uh, in the last 10, 20 years, or is it basically the same as it's been? Has anything improved at all? Oh as, yeah, I mean, 
you know, now we have radiologists who've had, young radiologists who've had MRI experience their whole career, you know? <laughs> They've been around, the MRI's been around since the early 80s, well, mid-80s at least, and, you know, people are getting better and better, and the, the sensitivity of the MRIs improve all the time. It's okay. like, you know, it's like if you're in internal medicine, um, I'll give you a, an analogy. I, I had a relative that came to me, and he had been a smoker, and he came to me with a point, uh, what was it, a five millimeter size lung nodule. And I said, well, it, it didn't look new to me at all. And I said, five millimeters, man. <laughs> and, and, you know, it dawned on me that when I was a medical student, you, would never, you wouldn't see something that small. Right. And what's happened, I think, is the technology and the sensitivity of the CAT scans, the MRI has gotten better and better and better. And, uh, you know, that guy's lesion's still there. This is like 15 years ago. It hasn't grown since. But, you know, the, <laughs> the CT scans just are, are higher sensitivity. I think we're not getting any smarter, but we're making better and better uh, technology so you get experience reading. You know, I, I think that it's clear that we, we pick up things that we never expected to see, and I think MRIs at first were a problem because I think there were way too many operations done for incidental findings mm -hmm. that, that probably are just variants of normal. We just didn't know it. Well, you know, going along the same line, Richard, transoral imaging is something totally new to me. But I would think that that area of imaging would be becoming more and more popular for imaging the C-spine. Is that true, or, or is, that, is that something that's becoming more popular? Well, you know, I, I think that there are, there are guys that are doing a lot of endoscopic cranial vertebral junction surgery. Right. Uh, Theodore Schwartz, uh, quite a few people. I don't want to, I hate to just mention one guy, but th there's quite a few that have done really great work. Charles Tiao, T-E-O, I think he's still in Australia. He does a lot of endoscopic pediatric surgery and has written a lot about the cranial vertebral junction. I think you're going to see more. I think en endoscopy is going to take this from being a barbaric operation to being a, a, a much more elegant procedure. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but the imaging's been great. I mean, yeah, the, the imaging's been great, not just because of the radiologists, but because of the engineers inventing right. the technology for the radiologists. So the I mean, because we're getting so, things are getting to be so, such, um, high sensitivity it's ridiculous yeah better resolution okay very good uh, I thank you very much Richard for an excellent presentation again and thank you for all the guests for coming to Larkin Medical Larkin Hospital TV uh, stay tuned for next week uh, at the same time we'll have another presentation and uh, well uh, let me just quickly announce we'll have a neurosurgery in Spanish next next Saturday at 11 o'clock uh, uh, by Robert Herrera, a neurosurgeon from Buenos Aires. He's going to be okay. talking talking about minimally invasive, uh, many, m minimally invasive neurosurgery. And Richard will will probably be heading the English neurosurgery. So thank you very much, everyone. Sure. Thank I think. You. What did we talk yeah. about last week? We talked about oh, functional neurosurgery. Yes. Yes. Maybe we'll start on that for next.